All right. So hello, everyone. How are we feeling? I see you charged, very energetic. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Michael, don't worry. It's going to be fine. <laughs> All right. Um, so, last. Uh, oh, somehow this is on the wrong screen. Okay. So, um, if you remember uh, last lecture, which was on Friday, uh, we talked a little bit about various ways in which uh, uh, many many interactions in the system can produce the formation of patterns, and we saw a little bit of the formalism of behind Turing, uh, the study of Turing instabilities. Um, and Amanda uh, shared uh, a very nice YouTube video. Uh, I invite you to see, to look at it, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, and uh, it uh, presents uh, in an even uh, more uh, interactive and fun way with some of the concepts I wanted to tell you about. And, uh, and then after that, we talked uh, a little bit about uh, a concept that is related to pattern formation, which is spontaneous symmetry breaking, that, which means that uh, it's, it's, it's sometimes, uh, due to the interactions in the system, uh, you have uh, the rupture of a symmetry that your system has. So for instance, I made the example of um, Let's use this one. I made the example of this rate process uh, from a system A to a system B. I mean, you could see them as geographical niches or whatever you feel like, uh, where in some cases, uh, depending on the, on the parameters of the model, you could either have, either have uh, particles that are uh, half in A, half in B most of the time, Right, which is what you would expect given that A and B are completely identical. Or you can have another situation in which actually only one of the, only one of the two uh, is uh, occupied most of the time by most particles, okay? So this is possibly the simplest example of uh, uh, spontaneous symmetry, symmetry breaking. Um, but there are other examples. So for instance, um, here, I mean, Turing instability is also a form of uh, sp spontaneous symmetry breaking in the sense that uh, uh, space, mm, wait a second, what happened here? All right. Uh, in the sense that any point uh, in space is equi equivalent to any other point in space, so it's, it's only, uh, through the interactions in the, in the derivative functions and the diffusion terms uh, that you break the symmetry. There is no external field that tells you this green point should be any different than this yellow point, okay? Um, there are other examples. Uh, I'm gonna actually skip them, but uh, you have the slides uh, so you can check them out. One of, one of them is diffusion limited aggregation. Uh, when particles stick together. And uh, another one is branching processes, which is a very powerful uh, formalism in biology. You can use it to, to describe evolution, uh, uh, phylogenetic trees, but also the process of birth and colonization of spatial niches. And in, in, in a nutshell, what you observe is that uh, you have uh, the, the formation of clusters, okay? So the, tra the translational symmetry is broken by the fact that uh, you end up having islands of either individuals or strains if you're looking at evolution. There are many different examples uh, where, where uh, branching, branching random walks, uh, random walks come, come in place. Uh, and, uh, uh, okay, this is gonna skip. And we saw uh, during uh, yesterday's computational lab, another example in which some microscopic rules of microbial interactions uh, create some coarse grain. If you start from random conditions, you can create some uh, coarse grain spatial domains 
uh, which break also the, the translational symmetry of the, um, of the system. And this was measured in this nature communication paper in 2017, which you have on the Google Drive if you want to check it out. And uh, uh, it, was, it can be modeled via some microscopic uh, rules uh, that follow, that can be formalized as, as a game theory uh, in a lattice, if you want, which is what we did yesterday. Well, we didn't have a, a whole lot of time to do it, but uh, you, have, uh, uh, you have the handout and, and the Python code in case you actually want to try and uh, implement it yourselves. Um, so we saw uh, a, a bunch of uh, examples. So this thing is, I think it's the symmetry. My mic is broken. I need to put a bit more in the center. Okay, hopefully this works better. Um, or not. Okay, well. All right. So, um, just as you can have some static uh, breaking of, uh, of uh, order or, or symmetries uh, in the sense that the system tends to something whose symmetry is broken, uh, you can have situation in which you have dynamical patterns uh, emerging. In the sense the system does not actually reach any, any kind of equilibrium, uh, but dynamically speaking you can, you can uh, define certain observables uh, on the system uh, that tells you uh, that certain symmetries are broken or certain patterns emerge. For instance, we saw uh, some, some movie of uh, ships uh, uh, that, uh, that, that go together in these fields. Uh, and we saw a movie on uh, f flocks of birds uh, that behave like a, some kind of wave. And we are actually gonna look at it again because today we're actually mainly going to focus on, on this system, so the, the birds, okay? So I'll show you again the movie. With, no, no, no. So, So you see that the whole flock moves in, in a sort of coherent way uh, and sticks all together. And the information about the direction of where the birds are going propagates to the whole group so that they can actually uh, fly in a coherent way and form these waves of direction and density. Actually, these are waves of information and uh, which can actually be somewhat quantified by uh, these movies. There are several very interesting works by the group of Andrea Cavagna in Rome and collaborators of theirs uh, on how to define certain properties of the system and how to measure them. <coughs> and, uh, and if you zoom in the system, uh, you see that uh, you can hardly tell what, what this macro state, macro state system is doing at the whole group level if you, when you zoom in, right? Which is precisely the properties that uh, even though it's local interaction and local information that creates these emergent patterns, uh, you cannot really predict uh, the group behavior only by the behavior of the individual. There is some breaking of symmetry phase transitions, depending on whether you're looking at some uh, physics system, uh, that, uh, that creates some emergence on some new pattern. So as Anderson used to say, more is, more is different. So today I'm gonna try to tell you some uh, about these flocking birds a little bit more quantitatively. And uh, the best way to start is to consider a situation in, in which you would try to implement 
the few, few rules to reproduce these, these dynamics of uh, flying birds. So, one, uh, I can study the, the group of motion of voids, which are bodies of birds, something like that, it's a, like pan. Uh, that was that was implemented uh, in the 80s to to, uh, to actually reproduce uh, uh, the, these these flocks of birds or fishes. I mean, maybe maybe some of you I don't know if any of you do does scuba diving, uh, but if you do and you ever saw uh, a group of barracuda swimming together, uh, they create a very uh, coherent uh, bank or tunas, they, it's very, these things for birds can be related uh, very closely to other animals, such as fishes, sheep, and we, see, we will see other examples as well during the, um, during the lecture. So for instance, here, here you see a picture of some fishes, okay? I, I don't know which fishes are these, maybe, maybe they are barracudas indeed, but barracudas create this kind of vortex when they are chasing some preys uh, to capture them in the, in the middle. Uh, it's a beautiful thing to see. So, anyways, these voids uh, that uh, uh, in order to reproduce these coherent motions uh, need just a few rules. So for instance, you want them not to co collide so the two, two birds cannot, you know, uh, in, like uh, be in the same position. Uh, you want to go in the same direction of your neighbors. So this is the interaction that makes them go all together because otherwise they would all randomly go in uh, different directions. And uh, you need some rule also for them to want to stay all together, okay? Uh, otherwise, even if they want to align, the noise in this process would eventually make them so far away that they would never, they wouldn't see each other anymore. In a way, in a way, you need a rule that keeps the system confined. So, I found this YouTube video, yet another one, um, that I find really instructive, where essentially they coded up these rules plus some other thing where they have to avoid objects and do funny stuff. But essentially the, the nature of the interaction between the voids is the three rules that I just told you. And uh, so for instance, you can start with one and then you put a bunch of them and you see that uh, just a little bit like the birds we were observing, they tend to like uh, stick uh, in a group. And you can like, uh, as more you put, uh, you have different groups going in different directions, but the groups are actually following the same direction. Here the space is confined by these red dots that in this code um, they, they, the birds have to avoid. And, uh, and then you can play around with these rules and you can actually sh switch on and off uh, any of the three rules that I just uh, told you about. And, uh, for instance, yeah, let me find where actually it does it. Okay, so for instance, at some point here, it switches off uh, the rule where they want to go align with one another, and you see that all of a sudden, all of the birds go in essentially a random direction. They still, they still want to stick together, okay? So they will, you will see that when one bird uh, finds alone, it will turn on the other direction to actually stay together with the other birds. But they, they are not aligned anymore. They just, you know, do some kind of uh, expansion, contraction uh, things. So they don't have this, uh, uh, this aligned motion anymore, okay? And then you can actually even turn off this other rule, in which case, essentially, they behave like a, uh, a gas of particles and uh, in the end if you switch off and now it's switched, switched on back the alignment, uh, it was written here very briefly uh, and you see that you recover the, uh, the aligned motion and if you switch all of the rules off 
essentially what you end up having is what uh, in physics we call an ideal gas, where, which is a gas of particles uh, that don't interact with one another in any way, which was studied. It's, it's you know, due to these very strong assumptions, is, you, can, you can study analytically a lot of the properties of the system. And Boltzmann uh, uh, is, is one of the first people who uh, did that extensively and created the, uh, a framework which is called statistical mechanics uh, that can be used to derive some uh, macroscopic information uh, on some system based on some local mic microscopic rules, if you want. So you can, you see how switching on and off just a few very simple rules to go from uh, uh, something that was studied in theoretical physics uh, 150 years ago to the, to the, as close as we are right now to the understanding of, uh, of, of motions of birds or fishes or other, other things. Uh, actually, there, there is a link, I will actually link this, this YouTube video. You can check out the GitHub page of this guy and, uh, and play around with the code if you wish to do so. Um, so, now back to our presentation here. Okay, so I hope I could, you know, some, somewhat convince you that uh, uh, due to these local interactions and, and flow of information, uh, even without anything special about any position or any specific birds, uh, you can uh, create this emergent uh, pattern. And uh, we will actually do it uh, tomorrow uh, in, in the computational lab. You, you will be doing something similar to uh, these voids. We will actually be implementing uh, uh, something called uh, the VIXEC model, which was introduced by VIXEC precisely to study this kind of uh, uh, emotions. Uh, and, uh, but today I'm going to give you... Why? And what, what's going on here? Wait a second. Sorry about that. Ah, here we are. I probably click end. And uh, so, as I said, the VIXEC model uh, that was introduced to, to study this, uh, uh, this, this, this motion of birds which is similar to this uh, discrete implementation that I just showed you about the, vo the voids. The rules are just slightly different. So essentially, and again, we, we will implement this to, tomorrow, but today I'm going to give you a little bit more of the theory behind it, OK? So you, you reorient uh, given uh, what the neighboring, neighboring birds are doing, just like the boys that we just saw. And uh, therefore, implicit in this rule is you have a notion of neighborhood, OK? You have a notion of like which bird is close or far away from you. So in the standard VIXEC, there are other variations, but in the standard VIXEC model, essentially, each bird senses a radius r around it, which is somehow how far you can see, if you want. And uh, based on the direction of the birds inside this radius, it will reorient, reorient itself to go in the same direction, OK, on average. Then, of course, this process is not perfect. You don't have infinite information on the system, for instance. Therefore, you have some random noise that you add to it. I mean, yeah, you orient yourself, and then you kind of randomly go in one or the other direction. And then you move ahead based on the direction that you were following, OK? So if you write down the equations for this, uh, for this uh, kind of system, basically, uh, the velocity at time t plus 1 of bird, of bird i is going to be uh, equal to the direction. These, these, okay, these brackets uh, uh, are just a notation for the average. I use the same notation in the replicator equation, if you remember. 
okay? This is just the average of the velocities within a radius r, okay? So this is the average direction of motion of the burst within r times a parameter that tells you how fast every each of the bursts is going. In this model, in the original version, they study a system in which uh, all of the birds go uh, as like with the same speed. Okay, so the only difference between different birds are uh, is, is their direction. Okay, there are, there are many many generalizations in literature. There are many words that actually study the situation in which this is not the case, or different rules for what you sense as a neighbors neighborhood. So you can have, have either metric uh, definitions or topological definitions in the sense that maybe it's not a radius, maybe it's a matter of the topology of the network because if I'm here and I'm staring at you, I'm not going to see what she's doing because she's behind you, right? Even though she's still very close, right? So in this sense, the, you have a difference between met metric and topological uh, like neighborhood definitions, okay? Uh, but, you know, these are like more uh, new, newer stuff that are, that, are, that are done in literature and uh, many of the properties of the system don't depend on, uh, on these assumptions. Uh, some of them do, of course. Um, but we will be seeing what Vixek did originally to start with. So, okay, and then I told you how you update the, the velocity. Then you just update the position uh, as the position plus the velocity. In this sense, we are modeling an overdamped system. There is no acceleration in this system, okay? For those, it's, it's as if these birds were moving uh, in a very high uh, friction uh, situation. And uh, um, then, uh, uh, and the velocity is going to be fixed uh, in this delta t interval, okay? So you don't have any variations of the velocity. So we can discretize the time, basically. OK? So these are the rules, OK? And then you can write down some equation for the angle. This is not a new rule. Basically, this is just rewriting this in a new system of coordinates. And you can write down uh, the update rule for the angle. Uh, given, uh, OK, the dungeon of the x and the y directions plus noise which is the same as, a per as the perturbation here. And the noise is just going to be a uniform uh, random variable between, between minus eta pi and eta pi. Therefore, in practice, this means that if you are a bird and you want to go um, in, some, in some direction given the the average directions of your neighborhood, let's say. Then you're going to add uh, a random vector uh, that can be essentially uh, in, inside a cone. Sorry, this is, imagine this is symmetric, okay. You basically rotate this vector uh, inside a cone uh, given by, whose slope is given by eta, okay? Sorry, eta, if you want, okay? In radians, this is what eta is. And when uh, eta is equal to one, which we will assume it's the maximum uh, noise level, basically you will just randomly reorient yourself in the semi-sphere uh, that, that, that corresponded to the uh, average direction of motion. So it's somewhat close to our, it's not completely random in the sense that uh, uh, you, you will not uh, be going uh, backwards, uh, but, uh, uh, sorry, actually that's not true. Let me. Actually, uh, if eta goes between minus pi and pi, actually the cone does take uh, the, whole, the whole plane. So eta equal to one uh, basically means that you completely randomly reorient yourself. Whereas eta equal to zero 
means that you will be going exactly in the direction of, of the average uh, uh, neighborhood. Okay, so these are the rules of this system. Okay, so perhaps, yes, this is a good time for questions. Uh, it's yeah. just a question about how this re reorientation happens mm -hmm. because um, the way that, that it's written there, it appears that the re this reorientation, re I don't know, change of direction mm -hmm. happen happens in uh, discrete time. Is that correct? Yes, this is, if you want, this is an overdumped system in which uh, you. Uh, take some state of the system at some uh, uh, time i, sorry, time t in this, in this notation, um, and then uh, the state of the system at time t plus one is going to be just that plus some random noise. Have you ever seen uh, the Langevin equation for the Brownian motion? What? Lange, uh, have you ever seen Brownian, Brownian motion? Yes. Have you ever seen, it's called Langevin equation? No, okay, so essentially you do, you do a similar kind of thing where uh, you write down, uh, uh, if you write down the equation, you don't, you don't consider the, the, the acceleration of a particle. It's as if you were considering a very, uh, a system with a lot of friction, basically. So, but so um, it's not like if, if the if if this change in movement is happening like a Brownian motion because it's not in every point in time it's just like in discrete time. Well, you can model yes, okay, if that's fair. Uh, you can actually model Brownian motion as a discrete time process. You have you can also model it as a continuum time process, but there are some uh, you know uh, Markov Marco chain uh, for uh, Brownian motion in discrete time. Thank you. But yes, this is, this is going to be a discrete time uh, kind of model. You can actually write down the continuous time stochastic differential equation for this system. I mean, you can do it. You can, you can take the limit of time going to zero, uh, provided that you are careful that there are no we call them uh, divergences in the system. Sometimes, you know, when you take the, the limit, uh, that, that can happen. Uh, but, uh, and I actually don't remember whether in this specific system you have it or not. But uh, uh, I've seen papers where they wrote down an Hamiltonian system for this, for precisely this, uh, this uh, model uh, in continuous time plus noise. So continuous time with differential equation. But for us, it's easier conceptually to consider discrete time uh, rules, right? So you're going in a direction at a certain time i, and then uh, you reorient yourself as your neighbors plus some noise. So this is like uh, the, the most intuitive way to think about it without having to deal with uh, a lot of math, essentially. Yeah. And other questions on this system? Is it uh, more or less clear? Is it too abstract? Is it... Uh, not abstract enough? There are, there, is, there are two questions, okay. Uh, can I just turn on the light? Uh, sorry, yes. Uh, <laughs> I forgot about that. Thank you. Sure. Uh, okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna Hello. make my question. Okay. Um, I, I guess I kind of understood. I'm just trying to still maybe make a connection with what we've seen with the Turing patterns. And like, like, oh, I understand that this has something to do with the Ali effect. With what maybe with, with the Ali effect? Ali. 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 I don't know. A L L E E. Ali. I don't know. Um, I just, I'm trying to understand, like, how is this connected to, uh, like, 
other ecological questions. So I guess maybe. The, the, okay. So I showed you a movie, right? I showed you a movie of birds, right? Did you notice that these birds were doing something strange or not? Or, or I should say, did you notice that uh, these birds were doing something that you would not expect uh, uh, from what you see from one bird uh, flying on their own? Yes. Okay. So basically what I'm trying to do, so, and... Uh, Hello, yes, this works. So, Natalia, if you are still uh, observing us from the, from the skies, uh, we need new batteries for the uh, portable mic. Um, so, the other thing is, is the, the key concept here is the fact that uh, you have some symmetries in the system that are broken. And this is like a very universal concept between different systems, okay? So I'm trying to take a bridge and try to show you different examples in which you can have either patterns or, or formation or symmetry breaking because the universality of this phenomenon uh, gives us a very powerful framework to study this system. Then I showed you the movie of the birds and one of the peculiarity of the birds is that uh, they move in, they, they stick together, first of all, and they move in some direction, okay? You saw that, right? That they move at a, at a given time point, they kind of move in the same direction, uh, all together. And uh, this, you know, it's, it's an example, okay, I was gonna get there probably in the next one or two slides, but this is an example uh, of symmetry breaking because there is, no there is no direction that is different than any other direction in the system, right? In principle, it, 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 there is, it, okay, you, some people may argue it's because of the wind, but it's not because of the wind, okay? Uh, and it actually was matched, so I mean, it's, it's that, that is not explanation. So there is no, the, on, the only direction that is broken is that, uh, is that of gravity, okay? So the only force field that breaks any, any symmetry in the system is, uh, the Z direction because you have gravity. But uh, the birds are not either going either up or down. The birds are doing uh, weird shapes all over the place. So on the, let's say on the plane at equal uh, height, you're still breaking the symmetry of the system that tells you that no direction is special, right? Intrinsically speaking, there is no Nothing that tells you that a direction is special with respect to any other direction in the same way that in this, in th in this example, system A and system B are identical. You don't, you're not, you're confused. Um, I didn't understand. Maybe if someone from like a biology, let me, let me continue. biology background, so I think it's gonna be clearer in just okay. in just a moment. Uh, let me continue on a couple of, a couple more slides, and then I will ask okay. you again if this were more more clear. But essentially, what I'm trying to do is that I'm presenting you this. I will show you how this system with this simple toy model breaks uh, some. Uh, uh, symmetry and how you measure it, uh, and then, uh, okay, I will I will argue that some of the properties of this system were were, were measured experimentally by the group uh, in Rome of uh, Andrea Cavagna and Irene Giardino. You have all of the papers. There is a there is a bunch of uh, PNAS paper in the Google Drive. Uh, I don't remember the first authors, but it's will with uh, Cavagna, Giardina, Bialek, uh, and a bunch of other people. Uh, you, you can you can check them out, check them out. But uh, let let me go go forward with a couple more slides, and then I I will ask you if it was a little more clear. There are two more questions, Tiago. 
and gear. I was, I was just wondering if it's okay for the approximation of the position uh, to call dt1 to say that our in time interval is 1. you have in the Google Drive as well. And what they did is that they renormalized the uh, time uh, so that, that, that dt is 1, OK? It's a, it's a bit of a theoretical argument, but uh, you know, if you want to infer things, you need to be a little more careful. Yes? Um, uh, I mean, there is a characteristic time scale if you consider the radius and the speed of the birds. Yes. Uh, so you either you either measure dt in units of that, or you measure that in units of dt. Uh, yes. But yes, that's definitely uh, certainly a good point. Hi. So um, I was thinking uh, if um, uh, this model was uh, derived from base principles about what you see of their movement and what you can assume just uh, seeing the the. I don't know, visually, the movement of the stalins. I'm, I'm actually missing some of the words uh, in the process, sorry. It's, uh, sorry, I, I'm, I'm still a bit sick, so. No, no worries. Boys. Um, so uh, this model was basically derived from um, basic principles about the movement that you can see from the videos, right? So this, this is uh, a model that uh, uh, the authors wanted to have as few ingredients as possible and get as much as possible about this bird system. So this paper is fairly old, okay? They didn't measure many properties of this bird system uh, back then. Uh, nowadays, people are doing much more detailed model because they have access to much more information. And uh, what kind of information is added in these more detailed models? new information, you mean, new yes. things. So for instance, there are, there's models in which, uh, okay, there, there are some uh, uh, studies asking whether these interactions should be metric or, topologic or, or topological. And uh, as far as I remember, uh, this, the, the, the experts of the field argue that it's topological, but I'm not 100% sure, I need to go back and check in the papers. Um, and then uh, they actually generalize for the speed to not be the same for every bird. And they actually derived uh, some pretty cool properties of the system, such as the waves of the densities of the, war, the, the, of the birds. And uh, these help them uh, quantify uh, m in a more precise way how the information flows uh, in, in, within the system. I can upload other papers as well in the drive where there is a big literature here because it's, I mean, they managed to do a lot of stuff on this system. Yes. And just one more question. Is there any study about why the, they do it, that the starlings do this specifically and not other birds? These starlings and not other birds. Well, this is a very good question. Uh, this is more of a evolutionary questions in some sense. Uh, or maybe not evolutionary, but at least, I mean, it has to do with uh, what are the typical conditions in which starlings live and, and uh, cooperate with respect to other birds. I, I imagine people argued some argument for it. I frankly do not remember that uh, on the top of my head right now, but it's definitely, definitely a good question. Uh, I'll, I'll try to look it up. Yeah, sure. Other questions? OK, let me, let me go a little bit forward, and hopefully this concept, will be, this concept of symmetry breaking will be a little more clear. Well, actually, it was right to the next slide. So if you. You have this model, okay, that was thought to was tr thought to try to reproduce properties of these birds with as few parameters as possible, 
And uh, if you study, okay, there are, there's a bunch of parameters, such as the magnitude of the velocity, in this case where it's uh, fixed, V0. Uh, and if you fix it, which is uh, essentially what they did in the original paper, um, the relevant parameters are the density rho of the birds in radius r. So if you want uh, uh, the, the, the interplay between how many birds you have and how, uh, how big r is, these birds are in a finite volume, OK? This, in this model, there is no rule that uh, there is no attraction force with, between the birds, like in the voids, but uh, the birds live in a finite volume. So this is, if you want, what confines the system. So R, R is the only length scale of the system, OK? And therefore, the number of birds inside R defines the density. So the density is one of the relevant parameters, and the strength of the noise, eta, is the other one. So you have these three parameters, essentially. And again, the original, the original work fixes V0, so they have two. And you can study the behavior of the system just as a function of two parameters. Of course, this system will not capture certain things that real birds do, because you cannot really think that uh, you can capture all of the life and complexity of uh, some birds with two parameters, of course. But this was not what they were trying to do. They were trying to get some macro scale behavior of the system with very few parameters. And the thi one thing that you observe is that uh, as a function of the parameters, you can have different things happening. You can either have random motion. Remember I showed you this movie of the boys where the arrows were going uh, in, uh, in different directions, OK? Uh, randomly, or for very low noise, and, but somewhat uh, low density. So few birds, but that are very good at aligning with their neighborhoods, neighbors. You get some islands of birds. And again, we also saw this in the beginning of that, uh, of that uh, YouTube video. Um, you have islands of birds that are going uh, in different directions. So each of these little islands here. And, and looking at this, each of these little islands is going in some direction, and all of the birds in the island is going in the, in the same direction. But then each of the islands is going in different directions, OK? Then if you increase the noise, but increase also the density, you have something that is not completely random, but it has some correlations. And if you de increase the density again and decrease the noise, you have all of the birds going in the same direction, OK? In this sense, this system breaks, it breaks more than one symmetry, but most importantly, it breaks the rotational symmetry. So you do the experiments with these parameters here. And at some point, if you wait long enough, and tomorrow we will do it, actually, if you wait long enough, the birds will be going all in the same direction. If you restart from random initial conditions, and you repeat it, at some point, the birds will go, will go all in the same directions, but in a different direction. There is no preferred direction in the system. And the, the thing that happens is that the, sp the symmetry is, is broken spontaneously uh, in some random direction. But all of the birds go in this random direction, which, in a very qualitative way, is what you observe in the real system of the birds. OK? You saw that you have this like motion of birds. And if you want, I can show the movie again. But uh, you saw that you have this like wave of birds that are staying coherent among themselves. And actually, in this sense, they are also breaking translational symmetry. But to explain that, actually, you need to include the fact that v is not the same for every bird. And that's, that gets a bit more complicated. But once they are all together, they move in the same direction for most of the time, OK? Are you, are you still not convinced? What defines the uh, preferred uh, um, direction of the system? What defines, uh, you mean a priori or a posteriori? 
a posteriori. So, okay, that's a great question. Priori. A priori. So, before, if you don't have any birds in the system, what defines where they will end up going? No, that's, I guess that's what I'm not. Well, nothing, which is, which is why nothing defines this direction, which is why this, this symmetry breaking is spontaneous. You don't have, it's spontaneous in the sense that you don't have any, anything in your system that tells you that this direction should be better than that direction. Which is why any time that you repeat these numerical experiments, the birds will be going in a different direction. And now I'm going to tell you a posteriori how you define what's the preferred direction in the realization of these experiments, which is not the same thing, it's two different things, right? In one case you're asking, before I run these thought experiments, where will the birds going, will be going? And there is no way of knowing because the system is symmetrical. And the other question is, after the realization is done, what is the, di the preferred direction of motion of the group? And that's what I'm going to tell you in just two slides, OK? Other questions at this point? So as we have been uh, discussing, uh, you have a bunch of symmetries or structure that emerge in the system. Physical proximity, which is what I mentioned before, because they stick together, and you see it in this, in this, in this one case. The phase, we don't really have it in this, uh, in, this, in this system, but actually one of the other generalizations that the people did in literature was this, with the fact that uh, you have an a direction of movement and the direction of orientation where the head and the tails are of the birds, actually. And then the one that we are going to be focusing today is precisely the direction of motion, okay? And uh, what you need is some number that tells you what is the order in the system. So you need a number that you can measure in your system that tells you whether the birds are going in the same direction to what extent or not, okay? So in this sense, these in the vocabulary I was using before, can quantify a posteriori how much this symmetry is broken. And uh, this, we call this order parameter, borrowing vocabulary from uh, uh, condensed matter physics, um, that uh, uh, describes, if you want, the macro state of a system. So it describes uh, the group all to, of the system all together. And uh, you can define it as, as you want, but it makes sense to have something that uh, it's zero uh, if there is no structure in the system, so if, the, if everything is random. So if you have a bunch of uh, uh, random stuff, this order parameter on the system will be zero, or it can be bigger than zero if you have an order in the system, okay? This has order, this has, well, it's not disorder in, in physical vocabulary, but let's call it disorder, okay? All right. So this parameter is defined essentially as the average direction of motion. So you take, oops, sorry. So you take uh, all of the arrows in your system that tell you in what direction each, each of the birds is going. So this notation means that you have a bird here that is going in this direction. It's the velocity of the model that, uh, that uh, I introduced before, okay? You take all of the arrows, so all of the directions, and then you take, on average, what is the direction. So you're summing over all of the birds, each of their directions, and then you take the average 
Okay, this, uh, this V is actually the um, uh, V0. Okay, there is, uh, there is some notation problem here. Uh, and, and you take the sample average of where, where the group is going. So, if, if you remember a little bit of linear algebra, if you have a vector in this, in the, like this and a vector like this, if you sum them, they give zero, okay? Zero. So, basically, if everything is random, on average, this thing will be very close to zero, okay? In this case, the order parameter called VA is equal to zero. And by how it's defined, since it's normalized by the, the um, modulo, the, uh, the absolute value of these uh, vectors, uh, when you have everything going exactly in the same direction, this VA is going to be equal to one, okay? Question. There are two questions. Uh, I would just like to to ask about the previous parameters. So you talked about the magnitude of the velocity. How do you uh, the magnitude of the the third magnitude of velocity? This v zero. Ah, the velocity. This, yeah. Uh, How do you define it? Uh, it's the and uh, uh, so initial conditions values you arbitrarily no, no, so, sorry. Select, so, so this is a little bit of, okay, I see. Uh, V0 in this case does not denote an initial condition. This is, this is, this is in fact V0, and this, and this means that every bird has the same magnitude of the velocity, okay? So, the length of this vector is going to be the same for every bird. The only thing that changes is the direction, okay? But they all have the same length. In, the same, in other words, they're, they're all going equally fast. This is the, this is the speed. This is, in fact, this is the veloci velocity because of it's a vector. This is the speed, since it's a scalar. Right? In, Eng in English, we say there is a difference. Velocity is the vector that includes uh, the, di the direction, and speed is the scalar that tells you how fast you're going. Okay? So, I've actually learned this fairly recently. I didn't know that before. So, um, um, the speed, so how fast you're running, is going to be the same for all of the birds. But the direction in which you're going is going to be different for each one of them. And this is V0. This is, this, is what we, this is one of the parameters that we call the magnitude of velocity because it's uh, essentially the speed. Yes. Uh, if actually, uh, give us first. <laughs> Hopefully, yes, it's not broken, great. I, I hope I, I answered your question. I can, I can understand, but in the real life, the, uh, this velocity is the same? In the real birds, this is not true. And, and this, is, this is a model that, is, that was introduced a long time ago. And we are doing Oh, no. Because it's the simplest uh, possible thing we can do in a one hour class, OK? There are many papers where they are doing something more realistic, but then the math becomes much harder, okay? Uh, it's just... <laughs> okay, whatever. Uh, please. Uh, just a silly question. Um, when you are um, quantifying the order of the movement with, uh, with, the, with the average vector, you are taking the, um, the standard Euclidean norm and then uh, standardizing it, right? Yeah, so, yes. Wait a second. Wait. Oh. Uh, yes, there, right? No, no, uh, in the, when you were explaining VA. Oh, you were, sorry. Yeah. So th that's just the uh, Euclidean norm of the uh, average of the vector. Yes. Okay. Yes. 
Um, just, to just to clarify, you said that the velocity of the birds are constant and the same V0 for everyone. But then on, when you were writing the evolution of the velocity, the changing velocity over time, you added a perturbation. Mm -hmm. and so that, that would change the magnitude of the vector. I, I didn't understand. The magnitude of the? The velocity vector. Uh, no, so yes, OK. So, so yeah. perturba here, by perturbation, we only mean per perturbation in the perpendicular direction. And actually, I'm defining here what I mean per by perturbation. You see? So it's a perturbation only in the angle. Other questions at this point? So we define this vector that is the average. Is it, is it some, somewhat clear to everyone that uh, this, this is a measure of order in the system? Is it clear what I mean by that? So to whom is this not clear? This is, a, this is very important. OK, I'd rather, spend, I'd rather spend some more minutes here than, than go ahead and have uh, everyone confused. So who is confused about the fact that I'm calling this a measure of the order? No one is confused. OK, that's good. Uh, so once again, when this is 0, it's because all of the birds are going randomly around. It's not going to be exactly 0, but it's going to be close to 0. Um, and when this is 1, if you look at how it's defined there, it's because they're all going in the same direction. So and the direction is what I'm focusing on, and then calling the overall direction order. OK, this is what I'm calling order in the system. So we can study how this order parameter behaves as a function of the model parameters. And we, see, we can see two things. We see that uh, um, the order parameter decreases with the noise. So if you have very little noise, essentially every time you reorient yourself, you reorient yourself exactly in the direction of motion of your neighbors. And if you repeat that enough time, this ends up in everyone going in the same direction, because there is no noise in the system, OK? But again, which direction that, that will uh, happen uh, is not a, a, a part of the model, OK? It's not given by the model. It's probably going to be driven by the initial conditions, but it's not, uh, it's, it's not given in any of the modeling ingredients. You repeat it. Uh, you repeat another random uh, experiment another time, you will see another direction. But they will still be going in all in the same, dire same direction uh, with respect to one another. Okay? Then if you increase the noise, it means that you're basically you're, you're, you're orienting yourself randomly. And as the noise increases, this order parameter goes down to zero. If you have a lot of noise, it doesn't matter that you're taking as reference what your neighbors are, are, are doing, because in any case, you're just going randomly right after that, uh, in a, like either way. OK? Yes, question. Yeah, but our eta parameter was going from 0 to 1. What happened? It's going from 0 to 1. No, the, the eta parameter. The eta parameter. It was going from zero to one. To uh, I think this is a, uh, okay. I think this is a different definition. Uh, this data, this this figure is taken is taken from the original paper, where they actually see, yeah. Sorry about that. You're right. Uh, where they actually defined. Uh, where they actually defined these minu from minus eta to eta. So actually, eta goes uh, from zero to six to two pi. From, sorry, from oh, and actually, if it goes from zero to eta. Uh, it goes from 0 to 2 pi, which is 6.28, whatever. So, gosh. so this, is, this is close to 2 pi, yes. It's, uh, the, the notation is inconsistent. And tomorrow we will be implementing this. So the, in, in the code tomorrow, the noise will be going to from 0 to eta, okay? 
And uh, okay, but apart from this, I hope that the point is clear. Okay. Um, and the other, the other important thing that you see is the, is the dependence on the of, of the order parameter uh, on the density, rho, uh, number of birds per in, within one radius, and you see that it goes from something small when the density is small to um, something big when the density is big, meaning when you have more birds uh, to take information from, then the system will have higher coherence, okay? And actually, and I would like to do some stuff on Blackboard now. Let me check, yes, that I'm not missing anything. So I think it's good So, basically, for the number of birds that goes to infinity, something that was derived about this model, this is, this is, this is when you take the thermodynamic limits, uh, taking, borrowing the vocabulary from uh, the, the study of gases, okay, in thermodynamics. Um, VA tends to rho minus rho C to the power alpha, okay? So basically, you have a power low behavior of the order parameter as a function of the density. You have a scale-free behavior, okay? If rho is bigger than uh, some critical density, then at all rho uh, scales, uh, the, the relative increase in the order parameter is going to be the same at all scales. So this is a signature of scale-free behavior. And this is called critical exponent. And what is cool is that if you take different models with different ingredients, they will have different Rossi. Rossi is this thing here, right? So Rossi is this line here uh, below which uh, essentially uh, you, you don't have anything, like you have uh, no, no order in the system. And this is that analytical result for n equal to infinity, but this is only true in the thermodynamic limit. Of course, when you, when you simulate a system, you don't have infinite birds, you have a number of birds, and these squared here show the simulation results, and therefore these are called finite size effects in the system that uh, produce variation between what you're simulating and your uh, analytical result. Okay? And we are gonna, we're gonna do this, uh, we're actually gonna do this tomorrow, but uh, you also have, you also have uh, a eta uh, minus eta c, actually, in fact, it's eta c minus eta to some power beta, okay? There is a critical exponent for the dependence on the noise as well, okay? Which is what we are going to try to do. I'm losing all of the shock. Uh, <coughs> we're, it's what we're going to try to do tomorrow. And uh, this happens because uh, you have some correlations in the system that break the symmetry, okay? So this, and uh, sorry, I was saying, uh, if you take a different model with different ingredients, this is going to change, so the critical value of rho for which uh, you have this transition is going to be different, but the critical exponent is going to be the same for a lot of different models. So this is well, something well known in theoretical physics, we call it universality. It means that uh, many different things uh, will show, okay, the same critical behavior when you have a phase transition, uh, or the same behavior when you have some symmetry in the system that is broken. In this case, you have the symmetry breaking of rotational symmetry. Therefore, this produces, and I'll tell you in a moment, thinking about correlations, uh, this produces 
some scale-free behavior as a function of the parameters. And the exponents, the critical exponents, do not depend to some extent on the, on the microscopic details of the model. Okay? You can have different models with different ingredients that produce the same critical exponent. Okay? Alpha and beta will be the same. So this is a very powerful thing when thinking about uh, modeling biological processes because you can have some assumptions, some things, but uh, ultimately if you look at these very conserved quantities of the system, these are going to be universal, okay? So, but of course, one, one always has to be careful about this part, okay? When you make measurements, you need to make measurements of very different n and try to extrapolate to actually, because you, when you need to infer this from data, it's very tricky. But it can be done. People did it. Like Irene Jardin, Andrea Cavagna, they, they measured in, experimentally. They took movies of the birds and they measured these things. They measured the, the, the transition, the critical transition, and they measured the critical exponents from data, okay? I'm not talking about... Uh, uh, just simulations. So, but why? What is it that uh, produces the breaking of this symmetry? As we mentioned more than once in this lecture, it's, uh, it's due to the local interaction. So you can introduce a new uh, mathematical uh, object, which is called correlation function, which basically tells you, if you look at the system, and you look at the fluctuations in the velocity, OK? So you could see that as already uh, v minus the other. This is v. The arrows are V minus VA, if you want, OK? These are already the fluctuations. In fact, so one, when, you, when you look at the fluctuation, this is going to be like something like this. Some small vector that tells you how far away you are from the average. And uh, this tells you how, how correlated two particle, two words at distance r, are from one another, OK? Which is going to be, OK, uh, proportional to some, uh, essentially, you can take some ij, ui, uj where u is the, uh, the f difference with the average velocity. So this is a definition of correlation, OK, for, for those of you that did some statistics before. And for, you, for you, those of you who didn't, this is essentially just doing this. It's taking birds at distance r and asking uh, how, how much mutual information, how much correlation there is between their directions, OK? over some uh, normalization factor, OK? Don't worry about uh, the, 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 if there are some math symbols you don't know. This is, a this is a delta function that basically counts only those pairs of birds that are exactly a distance r. And uh, in many systems, c of r is going to be proportional to e to the minus r over some d, where this is an intrinsic length scale of the system. It means if you are much far out, farther away than d, these two birds are going in different uh, uh, directions, in very different directions, com completely uncorrelated. If you are below d, then these birds are going to be, if you're close, then these birds are going in the same direction. This is a signature of a system with an intrinsic 
correlation uh, length scale. In this system, you don't have it. In this system, in the birds, it was measured experimentally. So you can either trust me for now or check out the papers if you want to double check that. You have uh, some uh, correlation function that is a function of the distance and of the size of the size of the flock. Why, why the size of the flock? Because again, this is not an infinite system. We are not in the thermodynamic limits. So you, when you take measurements from data, you need to consider the fact that you're measuring something real, finite, okay? Uh, equal, uh, this is gonna be equal to r, r to the minus gamma times some function uh, of the relative scale uh, between the, um, the distance and the size of the flocks. Where f of zero is going to be equal to one, so these things here, c, tends to r to the minus gamma uh, for l or n uh, that tends to infinity. In fact, with n over l equal to rho constant. So in a way, taking l to infinity is the same thing as taking n to infinity, OK? Which, which is a signature of, of a system where there is no uh, lens, correlation lens scale. At all scales, if you, if you are to zoom out from the system, if you take this system and you are to zoom in in this small region or to zoom out, okay, you zoom, basically uh, you, you don't have the, corre the, di the correlations at different distances uh, don't depend on, uh, de depend only on the overall size of the thing that you're observing. There is no intrinsic uh, scale that tells you how far away things become uncorrelated, okay? And if you plot the correlation length, if you now go back to the, to the situation in which you have a finite system, and if you plot the correlation length C of R, given a certain L, and you define C as the distance at which you go below a certain uh, threshold. Sorry, this is the threshold and, and this is C. Uh, if you plot C as a function of uh, the, the size of the system, you find, and again, these are exp this is an experimental result, uh, you find that uh, the correlation length scale increases linearly with the size of the flock. What does this mean? It means that uh, the birds inside the finite size flock are all correlated together at the whole system. Okay? Which is something very typical of uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking. When you have a broken symmetry in the system, whether be it for some self-propulsing situation like this, or whether be it for because of uh, um, some phase transition, uh, some, some critical behavior uh, in physics, uh, you have this scale-free behavior, and you have this signature of uh, like uh, correlations that can, that can become as big as the whole uh, system, okay? So, I know this is very abstract, and it takes, you know, to dig, dig down into the mathematical reason for this, it actually probably takes a six-month course in statistical field theory. But the key concepts are that you can measure some things on the system related to the symmetry breaking, and you can infer certain properties of the system that are universal uh, with respect to the specific uh, thing that you're measuring. And then you can transfer them to other systems. And you can infer properties such as 
they interact, whether birds interact topologically or, or in a metric way, you can actually infer, back infer uh, properties of the microscopic rules that governs their interaction as well. Okay? I, I know this is very abstract, but I think you should know that this stuff exists. Okay? And uh, so, okay. Now I gave you a little bit of the hard math, uh, but uh, just to produce examples of other situations in which you have some local, local rules that uh, break symmetries, I am going to present another experiment on locusts where you have locusts that are, locusts is this insect here that, uh, that uh, destroy all the, all the fields uh, or, the, or the cor all the corn fields when they get there. So they did an experiment and we have another YouTube video where they put a bunch of these insects in a, you know, uh, round, uh, round uh, torus. And uh, when you have a few of them, you see that some of them goes in the direction, then there is one that goes in this other direction. If you look at the system, basically there is no preferred phase, essentially. Uh, they are going somewhat randomly. But when you put more locusts, then they start do you see? Oh no, they, you actually don't see the mouse, I thought. Uh, they start going a little bit more uh, together. And then at some point, uh, I don't know if it shows in this video now, but at some point you have reversals. And they start going uh, randomly, they switch to, a, to, a, to the other direction. And when you put a lot of these locusts all together, a lot of these insects, they all go. Well, not all of them, but I mean the, the, the group goes in the, same, uh, in the same direction, okay? So this is very similar to the birds, if you think about it. So the birds were going in the same direction in a three-dimensional space. They are doing the same in a one-dimensional space, effectively, because they can only choose the angle. Uh, but uh, uh, in the, the mechanism is very similar. The locusts are seeing what the other locusts uh, around them are doing, and then they are deciding to go in the same direction or to go in the other direction. So, you can actually write down uh, some equations that are very similar, actually. These are very similar equations than the other, uh, than the other like uh, model for the birds. There is a little difference which is given by a parameter alpha here that they introduced uh, to, to say how much uh, locusts are stubborn, so how much they want to keep going in the same direction as they were going before, or how much they, they actually want to bend to the social rules of their locust community and, and decide to follow the other locusts. And, uh, Again, you can, you can introduce an order parameter, which is essentially the same, the generalization, well, in fact, it's a speci special case. It's the same thing as before. We're essentially going, taking the average phase uh, where the locusts are, are, are working. This is the equivalent of taking the average direction in a situation in which you are on a, on a circle, okay? And if you observe this order parameter as a function of the number of the individuals, you see that when you have a few, these are, these are uh, uh, experiments, these are, these are uh, simulations. When you have a few, it's random. When you increase them, you have all of the locusts going together for some time and then transitions to the other phase. And when you have a lot of locusts, like around 50, uh, in the experiments and the theory, you see that they all go together, okay? They all go in the same phase. The last thing I want to show you is an experiment where uh, you take sheep instead of the locusts. And in this case, what you do is that uh, 
you train one of the sheep, which is the leader of the pack, to go in some direction, and then with some Pavlovian uh, algorithm to train this sheep to go where, where you tell it to go. And then you observe what happens to the rest of the group. So in this case, let's see if this opens, yes. Now you're gonna see, let me switch off the light because otherwise it's impossible to see anything. You're going to see a sheep here. Here there is a signal. Now the signal goes and you see this sheep this is the leader that was trained that starts running towards the signal, and all of the other sheep go, go, go behind, okay? You have all of the sheep that follow the leader. In this case, the, symm the symmetry of the system is not broken spontaneously because you train the sheep to go in one direction, so there is a preferred direction in the system. And, they, and in the end, you can govern the group behavior uh, based in which direction you make the leader go. So, but this is another example of, this is still, it's not spontaneous, but it's still a group, uh, a group uh, behavior. There, are other, there is another funny movie in which it doesn't work. So, it's, it's, it's a bit stochastic. So sometimes they follow the leader, sometimes they don't. Uh, you can repeat the experiment and, and quantify how many times this works. So now you see that the signal goes off, uh, the poor leader runs on its own towards the, the thing as it learned, and the others just stay there eating their grass and uh, they don't care about, <laughs> about what it's doing. Uh, but okay. Um, so. What, what was the difference between these two? Nothing, it's just randomly in one case, uh, oh. in one case they decided to follow the leader and in another case they, they didn't. So you actually can quantify you actually can quantify how many times as a function of the fraction. In this case, there was only one sheep, right, that was, was trained. If you take three, maybe, you have a much higher probability to actually get, trigger a group response. And here you can quantify uh, what's the fraction of informed individuals you need to trigger some group behavior. You know, you can think about sheep. This is very interesting in social science. You can think about sheep. You can think about where you place products in the supermarket to have people uh, buy them. You know, I mean, it, it, this is, these are real things. Um, but ju I just wanted to tell you that uh, you can actually also model mathematically this system with some rules that are very similar to the Vixek model I presented you, with the difference that here, you have a preferred direction which is given by where the leader wants to go, okay? In this case, you cannot really talk about uh, scale-free behavior and spontaneous symmetry breaking because it's not spontaneous. Again, it's not coming from the interaction, it's coming from the fact that you told one or few of the ships to go in one direction. Um, but uh, the, the types of model you can use are very similar. So you can use very similar techniques to describe many different phenomena, okay? Yes, one question back there. Actually, this is all I wanted to tell you, so we can take a couple of minutes of questions. In this model, waiting is like how much the leader will influence the others? Uh, yes, uh, yeah. exactly, yes. So are there other are there questions? I know this is a little bit mystic in some way. I mean, it's a bit uh, like uh, abstract, but uh, hopefully we saw the fact that you have spontaneous symmetry breaking in some system. We saw some models that you can use in different, uh, in similar models you can use in different uh, uh, systems. And we started seeing uh, some signatures of like uh, how the broken symmetry uh, produce, what kind of observables it can produce, and the fact that this produces a situation in which uh, the correlation be between the individuals spreads uh, to the whole group, basically, instead of being localized in a certain position. Question there? Uh, no, there was one behind you. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, when you said that this model is not used in the real nature, um, the, the real I story? guess um, that this model, like the model related to the birds, um, where it's not used in the real nature, I guess like that model is like the other models that are much harder um, is based on that model? Yes, so they are generalizations of that. They are generalizations of that for the case uh, in which uh, you add ingredients and parameters. So you add the fact that, that birds uh, have different velocities, have different speeds, actually. Uh, you add uh, different type of uh, interactions and networks of interactions inside the population. You also, uh, they also added uh, another thing I mentioned before, but I already forgot. Um, Ah, they added a phase direction. On top of the direction of motion, they added the fact that they are oriented in some direction. And they add the correlation in the orientation uh, between different, um, different uh, birds. Um, so they had a sort of like a spin model. It's one of the, it's, it's the latest, mo the latest uh, uh, works by Cavani and co-workers uh, uh, have some uh, uh, more complicated coupling between directions. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Yes. Um, you just so uh, I can understand better what is going on on the correlation function that you said for uh, is that a dot product product between? Yes, the these are this is the dot product. Uh, yeah, I, want, uh, I, I went a bit fast here. This is the docked product uh, of the velocity fluctuations. Okay, and uh, we're calculating the correlation for a given distance? Correct, this is, the, this is why you have the delta function here. Okay, um, but then you mentioned that there is a relation between correlation and symmetry breaking, and I didn't quite follow that part. So there is a relation between uh, scale-free behavior and symmetry breaking. In the sense that when you have a symmetry that is broken in the system, essentially this introduces correlations. Imagine the, if the fact that you have a, a symmetry that is broken basically tells you if the system is broken at the whole, uh, at the whole system scale, it tells you that the correlations will be positive for all of the um, all of the system. So it's not exactly like that in finite system, in fact, you see a correlation function that actually becomes negative and then goes to zero again. But uh, the, the length at which uh, you will have positive correlation will be almost as big as the whole system. Because you have a rupture of the symmetry, right? So if you have a rupture of the symmetry and they're all going in the same direction, this means that you have correlations. But you can also have, for example, like a disc rotating and you put a bunch of uh, like, I don't know, dots on the disc. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to have correlation between the movement of the, the dots, but there is no preferred direction. So now you're talking about, so. Uh, Just like the locus going around on a circle. Yes. If the velocity is proportional to the radius, you're going to have correlation between the but uh, in, in the circle, uh, what defines the thing is, is uh, define the order parameter is the phase, okay? Not, uh, not this, the modulo, like the, not the absolute value of the velocity. So, um, I mean, okay, let's see. What you're talking about is a situation in which you're putting a, uh, okay, so let, let me actually give another answer to this question. L imagine a situation in which you take these locusts and you put them in a disk and you basically glue them uh, uh, all together on the, on the disk. And then you spin the disk, okay? This will produce an order parameter of one. So basically that's a symmetry breaking, but it's not spontaneous because you're actually spinning the disk. But is the, is the VA equal to one? Because like uh, the, the average speed is going to be zero, no? They're, they are going to sum to zero. 
Uh, each one is going in one direction and it, when we take the average? No, when they're all going in the same direction, the, the, the average speed is going to be equal to the V0. Yeah. And therefore, since you're dividing by V0, that's one. But I mean, if they're all spinning on the disk, yeah. each one has uh, a given direction. No, but sorry, but in, the, in that case, yeah, that I went a bit fast on the locus. In that case, the order parameter is the phase. It's not the speed. It's not the vector speed. It's the phase. So if you want, it's the angle, angular velocity in polar coordinates. OK. So, so it's one. The order parameter is still one. You know, l let me redo this example with this other Cartesian coordinate system. You take uh, a paper, you glue the poor birds on the paper, and then you throw the paper somewhere, and all the, the birds are going in the same direction. Therefore, V is going to be equal to, the VA is going to be equal to 1. But this is not spontaneous. This symmetry breaking is not spontaneous. I mean, you're, you're actually, you know, taking the system and translating it. There is an external force in the system that breaks the symmetry. So, but it's still true that you, sure, you would still have correlations, but, uh, uh, you know, they, they are not emerging from the interactions. But yeah, it's a bit, uh, I, I, like the connection is very abstract. I'm basically just telling you, I didn't prove you that, uh, that are uh, symmetry breaking. I'm, I'm just trying to give you the intuition behind the fact that the symmetry breaking produces uh, scale-free correlations length. Um, in, a, in a way, it's like when you, have you ever seen the easing model? In a way, it's like when in the easing model, which is the ferromagnetism, when you have alignment of uh, uh, essentially magnetic force in some uh, material, close to the, to the, to the critical uh, point, uh, you have domains that are of any possible size, basically. So you have a fractal structure. So if you zoom in in the system, you will see the same pattern. And if you zoom out, you will see the same patterns. The same thing is true here if you have an infinite system. If you have a finite system, you need to do a uh, finite size scale ana uh, analysis and see that the correlation length Correlated with, the size of the, correlated with the size of the system, which in other words means that things are correlated at the whole system level. So you have this coherent blob of birds that are all going in the same direction. It's a, there's, there's a lot of math behind this, so I'm just trying to give you some intuitions, and, and hopefully you believe me if I tell you that these were measured. There are papers on the drive. You can read them if you don't trust me. Uh, so these were actually, con this was, these things were used to connect these theories and, and measure some very, very deep uh, conceptual values that are universal across different things on real systems of birds and the thing that are wor works on fishes as well. And for sure there are words of, on insects, on swarming uh, moths. That I've seen also. Other questions? And if you have questions, just, you know, reach out. Okay, thank you. Tomorrow we'll have a numerical, a computational lab.